This is Fred Kirschman again. So we've now looked at, you know, how the kind of agriculture that we have, the impact it has on human health. So how do we deal with this? What do, what do we need to do to begin changing this system? And there are a lot of things we could talk about. There are obviously many ways, but it seems to me that at the core of what we need to look at is that we need to fundamentally change the paradigm. And it seems to me that in both our agriculture and in our health care, we use a system that Joe Lewis, who I will show a quote from in a minute, calls therapeutic intervention. In other words, what he means by that is that in both agriculture and in health care, we wait until a problem emerges and then we try to address that problem by coming in with a therapy from outside to correct it. So you have a disease, you come in with some kind of therapy to heal the disease, in agriculture, you have a pest and you come in with a pesticide. And in neither case, we don't really tend to put much of our energy into looking what caused the disease or the pest to emerge in the first place and how do we create a healthier ecology to keep us healthy instead of having to come in with therapies or in agriculture to have a healthy production system instead of coming in with therapies. Like in the case of animals, of course, it's the same. We come in with antibiotics in both cases to try to deal with the problem. And Joe Lewis, incidentally, is a, he was the agriculture, he's a, he's a pest management specialist, but he's one of these big thinkers and thinks in terms of paradigms. And he's with the Agriculture Research Service in Tiffin, Georgia. And he is essentially saying now that at least in terms of how we deal with our production problems in agriculture, but as you can see from this quote, he extends that to human health and social systems as well, that the therapeutic intervention system now is essentially bankrupt because we just keep trying to solve the same problem over again, and in the process, we increase the dimensions of the problem. So here's how he puts it in a wonderful paper that he wrote for the National Academy of Sciences Proceedings in 1997. He says, the basic principle for managing undesired variables in agriculture systems is similar to that of other systems, including the human body and social system. So here he ties it all together. This is a similar approach, a similar paradigm. On the surface, it would seem that an optimal corrective action for an undesired entity is to apply a direct counterforce against it. That makes sense. You know, you get sick, well, let's get a therapy and heal it. You know, if you got a disease or if you got a pest, let's get a therapy to get rid of it. So it would seem like that's a rational way to do things. However, he says, there is a long history of experiences in medicine and social science where such interventionist actions never produce sustainable desired effects. Rather, the attempted solution becomes the problem. And if you think about that, both in terms of healthcare and in terms of agriculture. Let me just speak to it in terms of agriculture. When you come in with a pesticide to get rid of a pest, what happens is you never get rid of all of the target pests. So you create a more resistant variety of that pest, which you then have to have a more aggressive pesticide to deal with it. The attempted solution becomes the problem. And you also, in the process of getting rid of that target pest, you also kill other organisms that previously served as predators to keep pest populations down. So you actually increase the resurgence of pests. And so then you've got to come in with more pesticides. So it's really, he's, he's, he's exactly correct here. And I suspect the same dynamics is uh, taking place in healthcare in the therapeutic intervention system. Then he goes on to say, application of external corrective actions into a system can be effective, but only for short-term relief. Long-term sustainable solutions must be achieved through restructuring the system. The foundation for pest management in agricultural systems should be an understanding and shoring up of the full composite of inherent plant defenses, plant mixtures, soil, natural enemies, and other components of the system. And then he goes on to say, the use of pesticides and other treat-the-symptoms approaches are unsustainable and should be the last rather than the first line of defense. A pest management strategy should always start with the underlying weaknesses in ecosystems and or agronomic practices that have allowed organisms to reach pest status. And so there's the reference from which that quote is taken. So I think that Joe Lewis here is exactly correct. This is the kind of shift that we need to make in agriculture if we want to have a healthier food system and in turn a food system that promotes human health. And that's going to be more sustainable for farmers. That's not as costly for farmers. Now, it's difficult for all of us to switch paradigms, and farmers are no exception. So I'm not saying this is going to happen tomorrow, but this is the direction we have to move in.
And here is Eric Lander, who applies a similar kind of concept to uh, health care that Joe Lewis does to um, agriculture. And he does it in relationship to gene therapy, but that's only an example. And he says, already there are well-meaning discussions about improving human DNA. I find this somewhat hubristic myself, he says. The human genome has been 3.5 billion years in the making. We've been able to read it for the last, oh, I don't know, a year or so. And we suddenly think we can write the story better. It's very amusing. (laughs) And so here we are again, you know, looking at single gene approaches to trying to solve a problem, think that we're going to solve the problem. And, uh, And Eric Lander at least is saying, I don't think so. And then he goes on to say, there is the prospect that by changing things, we might put off aging, prevent cancer, improve memory. I find it a very difficult question. For my own part, I would put an absolute ban in place on human germline gene therapy, not because I think for sure we should never cross that threshold, but because I think that is such a fateful threshold to cross that I'd like society to have to rebut that presumption someday, to have to repeal a ban when it thought it was time to ever try something like that. And I think this is, uh, again, looking at it, and again, of course, we have in agriculture the same thing happening now. We're using gene therapy as a way to solve the problems we haven't been able to solve with chemical therapy. And I think the same thing applies. You know, we think that we can do these quick fix, single gene, single entity solutions, when in point of fact, what we're dealing with is a very complex living system. Our human bodies are part of that organism, part of that system, and everything that we use in agriculture is part of that system. And as as Lander says, it's been around for 3.5 billion years. And so natural selection has done a pretty good job of giving us what we got. And so we want to be a little careful about what we do in terms of trying to, um, to change that. So what we're really dealing with at base here then is an ethical issue. And what's really being called for here, I think, in all of this as we look in agriculture and as we look at healthcare, is an ecological model. And I think that Aldo Leopold gave us some very good insights around agriculture and natural systems that we could draw on for how we think about the future of agriculture and perhaps the future of healthcare as well. Already in 1945, Aldo Leopold recognized that this industrial agriculture was not a sustainable approach. He said it was inevitable and no doubt desirable that the tremendous momentum of industrialization should have spread to farm life. So he was saying that it was so attractive. And again, for a short period of time, it provided us with the additional yields, et cetera, that we thought we needed. But, he says, it is clear to me, however, that it has overshot the mark. He already saw this in 1945. It is generating new insecurities, economic and ecological, in place of those that it was meant to abolish. In its extreme form, it is humanly desolate and economically unstable. These extremes, as he calls them, will someday die of their own too much not because they're bad for wildlife, but because they're bad for the farmer. And, of course, we're seeing that now in agriculture now, in this industrial system of agriculture. Since about the middle of the 1980s, farmers have had to use all of their cash receipts just for the expenses of planting the next year's crop. The only net profit which they get are from government subsidies and off-farm income. So it's not working for farmers anymore. So Leopold was exactly correct about that. So what kind of ethics should we be thinking about? Well, he proposed an ethic 50 years ago, and here's how he put it. A land ethic reflects the existence of an ecological conscience. I love that term because I think that exactly sums up what we need to do. An ecological conscience is a conscience which recognizes the value of all of the organisms in our land community, as he he called it, our biotic community. And today, our conscience tends to be limited to our responsibility to our fellow humans, not to the earthworms and to all of the other organisms that are part of the system. And again, if either the whole system is going to be healthy or none of it is going to be healthy. So we really have to start thinking about the health of the whole system. And this, in turn, he goes on to say, reflects a conviction of individual responsibility for the health of the land. And health is the capacity of the land. And again, remember, every time he uses the term land, he's talking about all of the living organisms. Health is the capacity of the land for self-renewal. Conservation is our effort to understand and preserve this capacity. So Leopold was not a preservationist. He didn't believe that you could preserve things in a natural state. What we could do is promote the capacity for renewal of the whole system. And our health is directly connected to that. So if we want to reduce the need to come in with therapeutic intervention all the time, we got to start looking at how do we maintain and increase and improve the health, the capacity for renewal, including our own, how do we build our own immunities as part of that system. I think that's the ethical principle that we need to adopt as we uh, think about the future.
And then he goes on to say, the land ethics simply enlarges the boundaries of the community to include everything, soils, water, plants, and animals, or collectively the land. So this is our agenda. So I would argue that students who are interested in health care are, by this definition, also agriculturalists. <laughs> They're also conservationists, you know, because we're, we're all engaged in this together. It's either it's all healthy or none of it's healthy. So just one other point then about, and this is John Ralston Saul, who talks about health and food relationships in terms of our global economy. He's saying national health and food rules are treated not as the expression of people concerned about what sorts of things to put in this collective stomach, but rather as mere protectionism, unless backed by the hardest of hard scientific evidence. In other words, what he's saying here is that we're at a point now in our global food economy where if we decide that we don't want to eat something, the global food economy is now structured in such a way that it almost forces us to eat it unless we can come up with the hardest of hard science as to why we shouldn't eat that. And I think that, so this is part of the, the global environment that we've gotten ourselves into that we have to figure out you know, how, to, uh, how to deal with. And so uh, here's what I want to close with. Stan Rowe, who's a Canadian ecologist, who I think has articulated very clearly for us what's missing in our current paradigm is a missing concept and a missing attitude. And the missing concept is the ecological one of landscapes as ecosystems, literally home systems. Ecosystems are literally home systems. So this is our home. We need to start thinking about as the whole ecosphere as our home within which organisms, including people, exist. We have been taught that we are separate living things, but not so. The realities of the world are ecological systems of which organisms are components and without which no creatures of any kind could exist. So that's the notion that we, whether we're involved in healthcare or in agriculture or in food, I think this is the, the concept that we have to cultivate. And then the missing attitude, he says, is the sympathy with and care for the land and water ecosystems that support life. It will come when we make the concept of a planetary home part of our daily thought, part of our hearts and imaginations. And he uses the example at one point that we cannot be healthy inside of this ecosphere which encapsulates us unless the ecosphere is healthy any more than the fetus can be healthy unless the woman's body is healthy, which it also encapsulates, also encapsulates the fetus. And so that's a wonderful metaphor, I think, for us to keep in mind as we think about how we um, move forward with a new kind of agriculture and food system and a new kind of healthcare system.